Um, thank you very much, Yukiko. That was a splendid talk. Um, I only have a few comments because uh, I think we're all much more interested in hearing what you have to think and have to say and discussing this very fascinating work. I'll preface my comments by saying that uh, I'm a big fan of this work and of Yukiko's work in general um, for a variety of reasons, but most of all, the effort to make explicit and transparent some ethical judgments and normative judgments that often are at best non-transparent and implicit, but sometimes completely unexamined. Um, Sam and I have written on this, Yukiko has written on this as well. I think that if we're to move forward in the arena of health inequalities and health inequities, this drive for transparency, both for ourselves, being explicit about the kind of normative assumptions we make even in the empirical work that we do, and also in making recommendations to policy and decision makers is absolutely necessary. So, so this is a, one, a first, second, and third, and fourth step on, on the way towards doing that. I want to, I want to applaud uh, to the highest degree. I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't have some, some kind of critical comment of some sort, and um, I hope that my critical comments will be taken in the spirit of uh, a positive, constructive criticism, and also trying to open out some ideas for discussion. So I have three, three points that I'd like to make. Um, and, and most of them actually have already been prefigured by Yukiko, so I wanted to push you a little bit on some of your um, implications that you draw out. The first has to do with this idea of taking the residual, uh, residual or unexplained inequality and simply labeling it as unfair. And uh, you mentioned that some, some people in economics, uh, small literature might say, well, you know, if we can't explain it, how could it possibly be unfair? Um, I have to say that to a certain extent, I agree with that claim. And I would think, I would say that also there's, a, there's a, a philosophical literature that also agrees with that. So I'm thinking here of uh, Iris Marion Young has a, she's a philosopher, was a philosopher, the late Iris Marion Young, who has a very famous claim that unfair inequalities are those that we uh, are, we label certain inequalities unfair if we consider the causes of those inequalities to be unfair. The mere existence of an inequality simply cannot be considered unfair. We care about and we require understanding of why that inequality came about. So I would say, if I can, that if she were in the room, she might really take issue, I think on very solid grounds, for simply labeling unexplained inequalities as unfair. They're unexplained. We, we have to reserve judgment in some way. Um, I'd also say that Margaret Whitehead's very famous definition, um, I'm not sure what Margaret Whitehead might say, but I think that she might quibble as well. My, Margaret Whitehead also focuses very clearly on the causes of inequalities, and she, she has a matrix of different potential causes of inequalities, some of which she considers acceptable and some of which she considers unacceptable. So, so the question for you, I guess, is the narrow question is, what might happen if instead of labeling the residual as unfair, you either labeled it as fair, because we don't know, and if we don't know the causes, by definition, it's impossible to policy amelioration, um, or if you just discounted it altogether. The larger question that I'd like you and anyone out there to answer is, what do you think about this? Do you think that inequalities that we don't understand the causes of them can simply be considered unfair or fair. The second point that I would make is um, related to this, and it has to do with this idea of policy amenability. And I want to push you a little bit more on what you mean by policy amenability. It seems from, from your work that your definition of policy amenability is anything that we could potentially imagine a policy response to. That's very different from, in an, that's, a, that's sort of an abstract concept. So education, right? I can imagine a world in which everyone has the exact same educational attainment. It is within the realm of possibility to imagine that. 
in a way that I can't really imagine a world in which everyone has exactly the same height. That said, on the ground, in actual contexts, I can't imagine an actual policy intervention that would get at that. So distinguishing between theoretical policy amenability and actual policy amenability I think is really important and I wonder if that's possible or in your, in your measure or if you're not so interested in that and you're, you think that that comes after measurement. Related to that, um, I would say that policy amenability is itself an ethical evaluation. It's a normative claim whether something is policy amenable. So to take educational attainment, <laughs> I can imagine and would find very acceptable certain policies that would equalize educational attainment. Many people would not. Many people would say those are unacceptable kinds of redistribution. Same thing for income. Again, I think that by saying certain policy, things are policy amenable, you're smuggling in some normative claims and labeling them as empirical. Um, and I'd like some more comments on that from you and from the audience. The final comment has to do with, I think, your very provocative claim that, you know, given your findings, maybe all this philosophizing, you know, yammering about the definition of inequality and inequity just doesn't matter. If the health utility indices are so close that they essentially statistically overlap, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't have a direct response to that, except to say, while I'm very, very sympathetic in many ways to that, I think there is at least one place and one respect in which it really does matter. And it gets back to one of the most fundamental arguments within philosophy, but any, anyone thinking about health inequalities, which is do we really care about equality or not? By using the genie, by basing everything on equality per se, you're sidestepping arguments about whether we care about equality per se, is, is what we want to attain equality, or is it a kind of sufficientarianism where we want to drag everyone above a certain threshold, right? Uh, just to give uh, an example, um, I teach a course on public health ethics and policies for masters of public health students, and um, I only assign them one philosophical work, and it's, a, it's an essay by philosopher named Harry Frankfurt, Frankfurt, where he very provocatively says, most of the people who think of themselves as egalitarians, as caring about equality, don't care about equality. They care about things like uh, uh, eradication of poverty. Eradication of poverty does not necessarily require total equality of income. It simply means ensuring that everyone is above a certain threshold. This kind of approach doesn't address that kind of very important philosophical discussion about what our goal is. So, a uh, few questions for you, Kiko, for everyone else. Uh, once again, it's all in the spirit of, I think this is really fascinating and exciting work, and hope to see more of it. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Uh, can I respond? Yeah, so I think maybe we'll just take maybe five minutes to yeah. respond to yeah, Nick's sure. direct questions, and then sure. we'll open up the discussion. Because um, uh, I think by answering Nick's question, I can talk a bit more about the detail of what I did, so that's very nice. Um, first question was about the residual, and uh, I'm very visual, so I would like to have this. So uh, the first point is that um, this uh, indirect standardization is not something our team came up with. It's in the literature, and um, empirical analysts in the uh, it's more used for the. Um, the, uh, the access to healthcare literature, uh, they call it need standardization, but in the same thing. So the indirect standardization is out there and being used without any discussion about what to do with this residual. And then when you apply this method in a very, in the context that an ethics is very explicit in the way we did it, then it's like, huh, it's interesting. Is it like unfair or fair? So it becomes like a, everybody was doing it and I was doing it and I never thought about this question before. So it's, it's almost like a method is established but then we never thought about 
the question from an ethical lens. So that's the new part. And then yes, we did the analysis. Um, considering this component is um, not unfair. And then basically, it's the same result that then, uh, the, those definitions of health inequities wouldn't change. So, uh, and then uh, there are some studies looking at, uh, well, you know, residuals, and then some people say that it, this unexplained variation must be uh, coming from random variation, and it must be coming from some kind of systematic variation. Systematic, but we can't measure, and that's the problem. And if, if it is all random, it's kind of unfortunate that, uh, you know, somebody got ill randomly, but society cannot do anything about it, and some philosophical theory, and many of them actually say that, and that's okay. It's not the concern for justice. So the some empirical work looked at the if this uh, residual unexplained component is really random in the society, and the answer is not. So clearly, there is an unmeasured systematic variation. So what to do? So that's the discussion point. Uh, the policy amenability, yes, I totally agree. It is the ethical judgment. And then uh, what we did is that then we defined, um, so I said that um, here we removed this influence of legitimate component and uh, estimated fair HUI. So technical, technical audience, it means that then you hold certain variables, you don't want to see the, in, um, the influence constant. And then the judgment has to come in what value you hold those variables constant. And that becomes an ethical question. So the policy amenability, what we did was that, an, um, for example, education, you used that example, uh, we made a modest goal. So that in a high school education may be the modest goal that in a society can um, um, aim for. So all variables are set at the modest level. And then, and then what would happen? And then we did also ambitious goal. What if we say that you know, we want to see everybody is a college graduate? And then again, we didn't see that much difference. And then it's just you know, coming down to the, that big residual that you know, what we are trying to say is like really tiny component compared to other things. Uh, the other question you asked is that uh, it doesn't talk about the sufficiency view, and then uh, um, you know, is it really like if um, um, empirically we didn't see any significance, then we don't need to worry about it? I do agree. This is uh, this work is um, reflecting on the very typical way to look at health inequity that is looking at the causes of health inequalities. And I'm a little bit nervous to say causes because we just used the cross-sectional data. It's not causes. We looked at the just association. So that technical glitch side, um, this is really reflecting on the what is very popular. And then what we don't do is that then like income inequality literature is there and then there's a poverty analysis of the sufficiency argument. But in health inequality, somehow we always look at an entire distribution and we don't talk about minimally acceptable level of health, like a poverty equivalent, we don't do that. So that's a, another kind of work that might be interesting for future, I think. Was there any other question? Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs>